This is part two of the Full of Bloom interview with producer and engineer Bo Hill. In this segment, we talk about Rat's multi-platinum sophomore album, Invasion of Your Privacy. You can listen to excerpts from this interview at fullandbloom.com. Invasion of Your Privacy, where was that album recorded? Invasion was the Village Recorders. I believe we did all the basics there. And I think on Invasion, yeah, this was the one where the record, we were in the studio, we were in the middle of it. Marshall, the manager, picked up the phone and called me, and he said, we just got a tour of Japan, but I have to take the band out of the studio to do it. Now, that was complicated for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, at this point, since I'd had some success, I had time allotted for that, and then I had backup projects all on my schedule. And so it was going to interrupt that. It was going to interrupt the flow, and it it was just going to be bad for me. And so I said, okay, then here's what we're going to do. You can take the band to um, Japan, but I'm going to take the record back to New York so I can sleep in my own bed and I'll finish up all the junk I need to do at Atlantic in New York. And then when the guys are finished, whoever I need will fly from Tokyo to New York and everybody else can go home. So I went to, uh, to New York and I did you know, all the junk that I needed to do. I had a couple of weeks worth of work, comping, cleaning up the tracks, just getting everything ready to go. And uh, and then Robin flew over from Tokyo, and I finished some stuff with him. And I think Steven flew over as well, and I finished some vocals with him. Uh, Juan didn't come, to the best of my recollection. So anyway, it actually worked out really well from my perspective because I didn't have the whole band there over my shoulder making me crazy while I was trying to mix. So Robin was the only one that stayed as the band's emissary, but Robin was always very cool. You know, he would, he'd chime in and he'd say, well, how about this or whatever. But generally speaking, he knew that what my method was and that was like everything is going to suck until it doesn't and I'm going to try various experiments and EQs and reverbs echoes whatever you and I'm going to have like a 90% failure rate but the 10% that we wind up with is going to be pretty close and that was my process and so a lot of times if when I was experimenting on seller the guys in the band would come in and they'd hear me doing something crazy and they and then it's like no that's all wrong you can't do that well, so it was just very distracting and it really cut into my workflow but Robin understood that and so he kind of stayed in his hotel until I picked up the phone we got him a hotel right across the street from the studio and I pick up the phone I call him I say okay now I need some ears I need you to come over and talk me off the ledge here and help me tell me what's working and what's not so that record worked out really really great because of that and how long would you say it took to record that all in all that record took mix. a while oh it, and we also started working at uh, enterprise studios in burbank which is where we did all the horn parts for wake wake no no sorry wrong album wrong album <laughs> cool jr was number four yeah so we're back in new york and i mixed it in new york and uh, we mastered everything at Sterling, so that was right across the street in New York as well. So probably about so, three months, or uh, did it take longer than that, that? That one was probably about, had a three-month window, I'm pretty sure, because it, obviously at that time, you know, we didn't really have any budgetary restrictions, although I still did a budget, but Atlantic. Yeah, I'm sure it you just know, They just let me do whatever I wanted. Right. What did you spend on that record? I couldn't tell you, okay. honestly. But that was another that was another big 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 bone of contention I found out later was that Warren in particular didn't understand the way that that funding for a record works so he thought that if for example the budget was $100,000 Atlantic came over and gave me a duffel bag filled with dollar bills and got to spend it however he wanted to spend it and so it made those it made warren in particular really mad because he, he and he confided in me one day he said i just hate the way that you that you rush us into our sessions i hate the way that you start at 10 o'clock every day and i said 
why? I'm, I'm doing it to save you guys money. He said, no, you're not. You get to keep all the money. And at that point, the light went on in my head, and I went, okay, now this, this clears up a lot of the frustrating conversations that I had had with these guys over the years was somebody had told them along the way that Atlantic writes checks to me. And I said, no, I don't see a penny. I don't see anything. Uh, all the vendors get paid at source, which is Atlantic. So they send an invoice to Atlantic after I've signed off on the invoice. And Atlantic writes them a check. I don't ever get a penny. And as a matter of fact, if I go over budget, then it's coming out of my end. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but it it was um, it was. Uh, indicative of the the cross wires that we had about the business of going about making a record and working with with a major record company and these guys thought that it was going in my pocket and it was a huge huge source of uh, of irritation like every day when I'd say hey guys 10 o'clock they're all thinking in the back of their head oh, Bo's lining his pockets because he's making us come to work at 10 o'clock Amazing. You know, the one thing, though, that stands out is, again, you know, a lot of these guys that I've interviewed didn't think of any, not not just publishing, but didn't think of anything. So it's almost remarkable that they were that paranoid about it. And uh, and not only that, Warren is just like a, a little kid at that point, right? Yeah, I think, I think we did sell her. He was 19. That's pretty unbelievable yeah. that he even gave a shit about that uh, at that time. Well, I don't think he did at that Time. What I think had happened, and, and we'd run into, or I had run into this a couple of times. These guys were very friendly with the Motley Crew guys and, and with the docking guys and stuff like that. So when they would get together or when they would go on tour together, they would start innocently enough with these misinformation programs. And because nobody in the band really knew exactly what the fuck was, was the process, they took it as gospel. And we had one run in where uh, Blotzer had played a rough mix of something and Tommy Lee said something that, that offended Blotzer. And I mean, trying to weather that storm was quite challenging, you know, because it was Bo's fault and Bo did this and Tommy Lee says that and Bo, why don't you do it the way Tommy Lee does it and uh, all that kind of stuff. This was just another, another example of the misinformation and, and how it really uh, distorted our our working relationship. You know, more than anything, I, it, just the way that they can't get along with each other, it just really seems like that's just part of their persona. You know, certain guys get together, they're in that group together that uh, they all kind of um, are never satisfied. So I don't know if that has anything yeah. to do with you, really. I mean, as far as Steven's vocals, I loved his voice, but I also saw him on that Out of the Cellar tour. And my first concert was Judas Priest and Great White. Great White was really uh, rocking at that time. And Jack Russell was pushing his voice. And I mean, those guys sound exactly like the record. And then I became fans of Motley Crue and Rat and saw both of them and was just horrified by like, what the fuck? I was like, Vince Neil doesn't even sound like the same dude. And then same with Stephen Piercy. When I saw him in Dallas, I just couldn't even believe it. I was like, wow, he doesn't even sound really anything. You know, I was very innocent at that time. I just assumed everybody from that first concert I went to sounded exactly like they did on the record. But you, of all people, uh, cut his vocals by far the best. Later, it seemed like he almost added this whiny kind of sound to his vocals. I thought his last solo album, somebody worked with him pretty hard on his vocals because I thought he kind of was getting rid of that whininess. Well, I, I mixed the lead single for, for, I think, for his last solo album. I don't remember what it was called. Oh, wow. Well, then maybe that's why. Uh, well, he, over the years, you know, he and I, we, we have kind of stayed, stayed in touch. And uh, and and I, I would have to say, you know, we, we have a... a very a very good long distance relationship and and he has come out and actually said that that, that somehow whatever when we were working together that I get the best vocals out of him for some reason which is you know it's always nice if somebody says something 
nice about you, but but you know the thing about your, your experience when you saw him and Motley Crue, and what I tell people all the time is I say, well, we all grew up thinking that John Wayne killed Indians, but he never did. So that's where we just call it show business and we're good at that. Is there any kind of moment that um, stands out more than others or a good story from the invasion sessions? Yes. Um, Rat was opening for Motley Crue. They were playing at the Beacon Theater in New York, and I still lived in New York. And if memory serves, I had, I had, oh no, they're in the middle of touring Cellar. And I was still living in in my hovel, which which is a one room. It was a warehouse, uh, an illegally converted warehouse. And so I I rented a room from uh, from this guy, and I shared bathrooms, and I shared a kitchen, and uh, it was really nasty. And I had. The only furniture that I had was a box spring, which was on the floor, and then I had a couple of uh, packing crates that I used for a desk in my dresser. And so, long story short, they were in town, and Warren came down to my uh, to my apartment with his cassette player because he'd been writing some stuff on the bus. And so he, he came down and uh, and played me the beginning riff of Lay It Down. And I said, that's your first single. And I was, I mean, I was so excited about making that record. And I just thought, man, if this, if this is the level that they're going to play at. So Invasion was definitely my favorite out of all the rap records other than Way Cool Jr. I loved working on Way Cool Jr. Why is that? Well, you know, we did we did horns on it, which I thought was really fun, and uh, and I was a co-writer on it, so I guess that's also I kind of liked it, and um, you know, we just we had a chance to kind of stretch out a little bit and do some weird things, you know, like the that was me with uh, I sent my engineer to the drugstore and I said buy me eight thimbles, and so there was a. Uh, a hard surface on the on the console in the center of the room, and I just went over and, and took a microphone and pointed it at that, and then I just did that little rhythmic piece. The band allowed me to do it. My God, what is, and um, and then uh, added some harmonica at the end, and you know we just had some some different instrumentation, which made it really fun for me. And so, when the guys come in for invasion, are they uh, I, I don't know if I know publishing works to where maybe even two albums down they start seeing publishing from the first record. I mean, are they all rich by that point, or are they still kind of struggling? They uh, and I got this from their from their manager. Uh, each one of the guys in the band at the end of the uh, out of the cellar cycle had a net worth of one point two million. So. And considering that they were that they were gutter snipe when we went in to make out of the cellar, these guys were feeling pretty uh, pretty rich. Yeah, we're feeling pretty good, pretty good financially. I know you always had the tension going, but um, as far as um, cutting the record, but once it got going, were they more trustful? Yeah, of course. Um, either that, or, or they just they they found that my ideas and my approach was a little less controversial, you know, because it was our second rodeo and they kind of knew the drill and I kind of knew their drill and we all kind of knew areas to stay out of each other's way and, and things like that. So yeah, I remember that record as being, a, as being a little bit easier psychologically <laughs> to endure. And how was it working with Warren? How would you describe him? Um, well, Warren is, He's an absolute genius in in my opinion. And, you know, my biggest problem with Warren from a recording point of view, and I made one of my worst mistakes with him, my bad call. We were, back in those days, you know, you had 
certain physical restrictions like number of tracks available and blah, 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 blah. Even if you were running two machines simultaneously, you know, there still was a limitation. And we were doing a solo, and I wish I could remember what it was. But um, we did it, and I didn't have any spare tracks to save it. And Warren did this most mind-blowing solo, first take. So I just said, okay, so let's just, you know, we'll just warm up into this, and uh, and then we'll get down to work. And so I, you know, he said, okay. So I roll the tape, and I sneak over, and I go ahead and press it and make it red. He plays this mind-blowing solo, start to finish. It was perfect. And I stood there with my jaw hanging open, and I said, my friend, I, I think we're done. And and Warren said, no way. There is no law. Man, I can do a lot better than that. He said, well, I only had a chance to do it one time. I mean, come on. These are going to get better and better and better. And I went, I went, okay. You know, you certainly earned the right to uh, have another another go at it. So we had another go, and we did not even get within spitting distance of that first one, in my opinion. And so that, that was my takeaway from Warren, is that he was one of those kind of guys where I can always do it better. No, no, I can't. I really can't. And uh, sometimes he did, and a couple of times he didn't. It was one of those... One of those lessons, you know, those painful lessons learned in the studio. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't remember what song it was. Anything else come to mind on Lay It Down? Uh, I just thought, what a follow-up single. I just thought that song was incredible. Of course, that riff, you know, is one of those rare riffs that you think, uh, uh, really, there's just a few that you can really think of in that 80s period, that um, maybe Still of the Night by White Snake, and, uh, yeah. you know, some of those riffs that you're just like, holy shit, it, it was such a, every guitar player wanted to play it. Anything come to mind? <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I don't believe I don't believe I did any anything because it was. I mean, anything that I would have done to it at that point, I think would have actually detracted from the strength of the riff. And 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 Warren always. I mean, his performances. I mean, were always just mind blowing. I mean, I sit there with my mouth hanging open and just go, man, where'd that come from? <laughs> and uh, but no, I I don't. The biggest thing on on lay it down was was I did I did a few things different when I mixed it, um, and I put a keyboard part on it, uh, and you know I think I got a, a mini Moog and I reinforced some of the sub bass. You know, but this is all the all the kind of stupid shit that I would do when I was by myself. And then I just put it on a track and hope that nobody noticed. <laughs> I mean, I had to do all kinds of stuff. I had to mislabel tracks and, you know, just ways that I could figure out, look, if, if, if I don't have a big uh, – controversial episode about this. I think I can mix it and in where it'll do the job that I want it to do and it's not going to offend anybody. That was kind of how it how it got sometimes. Like I had to replace a uh, uh, a couple of guitar chords that were on Warren's track because for some reason they were just beating out of tune with everything else. And so his rig was there and his guitar was there and everything was there. And so I just turned it on and I played it. And and Juan just went absolutely batshit crazy when he heard about it. But other than that, I mean, nobody in the, in the band even knew. They did subsequently, you know, when I, I told the story or my engineer told the story and it was like, what? Both playing on Juan, on Warren's tracks? He's like one of the greatest guitar players in the world, which he is. And I certainly am not, but I know how, I know how to play a D chord and I know how to play an A chord. And I know that if I play it on his guitar with his settings, that I can make it work. That's hysterical. <laughs> you know, it was, it was 
all that crazy junior high school shit that sometimes happened. Was Lay It Down pretty much, I, mean, I know he had the initial riff, did it, but did he kind of write the entire musical bed, or, or did that song come together quickly, or was it hammered out? Um, no, I, I think that that one came together pretty easily. Uh, I'm assuming you, in, you, guys, -production. you guys knew it was a hit, right? Well, As a matter of fact, I was, uh, I will never forget this. We were, we had just delivered the final record to Doug and we were having cocktails at a, at a restaurant right across the street from Atlantic. <clears throat> and my assistant, assistant engineer came over and he, and I was sitting at the bar having a vodka tonic. I'll never forget this. And he said, Doug's on the phone. He wants to talk to you right now. And I went, oh, okay. So I went down, got on the phone, and he said, he said, I know you wanted to lay it down to be the first single, but I'm going to overrule you, and we're going to make it you're in love. And I mean, I was crushed, crushed that, uh, that he had changed that. I mean, it's his prerogative. That's his job. But I, I was so disappointed because I was I was sure that that lay it down was gonna was going to really be a high water mark for these guys and um, and really drive the sales of the record. I mean, as it turned out, you know, you're in love was also a hit, but I thought that that would have been a better second single once lay it down had uh, you know done its job. Lay It Down was absolutely the, the way to come out because it was uh, mind-blowing. You know, a lot of bands, you know, I was a huge Shout at the Devil fan by Motley Crue, and when they released that next record, I was like, what the hell happened? I always, I liked how Rat, uh, I know it seemed to aggravate them, it seemed like, that they would sound the same, but I liked that. I liked that they would come out just as strong or rocking as the next and didn't try to... Um, you know, wimp it out or something. Rat always kind of stuck to their guns. Yeah, they, they did, and um, and and that that was fun for me as as well. I mean, I I, I like knowing that 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 they're going to push the envelope as far as they can, but still, you know, be rat. Yeah. I thought You're in Love was a good song, and but I still uh, thought Lay It Down was the first single. I thought What You Give is What You Get uh, was a great song and should have been a single. And then I thought the mind-blowing part in the day where ballads would totally send the record into the stratosphere that I thought that closer to my heart. I rem remember listening back to that and I thought, why the hell didn't they release that as a single? They should have done a video, you know, maybe on tour and he's coming back from tour. I thought the whole thing out, I was like, somebody dropped the ball on marketing that record. Fortunately for me, that fell way outside of my, uh, my purview. Of course. And but I thought that that one should have been, you know, a lot of these bands would release like a giant record and then their uh, next one, like Great White was like that one with Rock Me. The next one was the one that I thought was a pile of shit. Uh, was the giant two million seller where you look back with the rock me and you're like, wow, that only went platinum. You know, I just thought yeah. that would have sent that into like five, six million copies, you know? Uh, I just thought that record should have been way bigger because each record kind of went down, didn't it, in sales? Uh, generally speaking, I think that's correct. But, you know, it, it's it's hard for me to quantify that at this stage of the game because they just they just keep selling. So over the, over the now over the decades, they could have... They could have sold another couple of million pieces, or I guess now it would be a couple of million downloads. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, it's hard to quantify, honestly, because <clears throat> I, I stopped counting record sales when my personal sales that I that I knew uh, went over sixty five million. Then I just went, okay, that's great. So <laughs> yeah. 
uh, I remember one of the guys from Guns N' Roses saying they would audit the record company every few years and every single time they would rip them off on like two million record sales. And then they'd call out the record company and the record company would say, well, go ahead and sue us. But they would just take a settlement and move on. Yeah, there, there was, unfortunately, there was some of that that happened. But generally speaking, uh, Atlantic has always been really good about that kind of stuff. Not perfect, but, um, you know, there can be legitimate errors and things like that. And if, and if there ever was one that was uncovered, Atlantic was always pretty good about uh, cleaning up whatever little issues there were. Is there a point where you noticed um, any issues with Robin as he started to decline? Or is there a point in the sequence of albums where you were like, hey, I noticed a difference in Robin? Yes and no. I had always sort of you know, suspected in the back of my head that Robin had some issues, but he was very masterful at um, masking what was what was going on. Uh, you know, he he was a big guy. He was six five, and so even uh, you know when he when he'd had that you know tenth vodka tonic too many. It, it didn't, it, you know, he just got, he got buzzed and got drunk like everybody else, but it, it was the, it was the drug use that he had very, very well. And, and I, and I knew that something was wrong when I was recording somebody else at, um, at Enterprise Studios. And the front desk called me and they said, hey, Robin Crosby came by to see you. And I said, oh, great, send him in. And he came in the control room and he pulled me over to the side and he said, he said, hey, uh, how much money you got on you? I said, I don't know, I got 80 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. And he said, can I borrow it? And I said, what do you mean? He said, he said, he got kind of agitated and he was just like, look, man, I just need, I just need some money. I need it right now. Cause he was, you know, he was there with his, uh, drug dealer and, and who was a guy I didn't know. So, you know, I gave, I gave him the money and that's when I really knew that, he, that there were some very deep problems with him. And is this after um, you're working with Rad, or still in the cycle of working with him? No, this was uh, this was I, I had already finished um, Reach for the Sky, and I was on to the next project. You know, and he just he just showed up, and there we go. And you didn't notice anything on say when you're recording Reach for the Sky. You don't notice anything like a difference yeah, in the studio. Uh, yeah, a little bit. He was he was a little more. Um, absent than he than he normally was and so you know warren was doing i think at that point robin didn't even attempt to do any solos so warren did everything i believe that's correct so you know robin came in played his rhythm guitar parts and then pretty much left and i didn't see him you know much during the during the recording at all and the previous album he was still okay well um I think an argument could be made that 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 he wasn't okay ever, yeah. <laughs> but um, for for dancing undercover, I he was he was more present. I mean, yeah, he was he was there and, and he would run interference for me and help me out as much as he as he possibly could. And um, yeah, I don't I don't don't remember. It was just on Reach for the Sky. There was. He just wasn't around very much. How about three high points or one or two or three um, high points of your career? Oh, God. Uh, I know you've had many, but uh, just ones that maybe stand out, like when you reflect on stuff. Well, one, one that, that's it's kind, of, it's kind of a funny anecdote. Um, I was in L.A., and I got a call from Herbie Herbert's who managed, among other bands, he managed uh, Journey, Europe, Roxette, and uh, Enough's 
enough or something. Anyway, uh, I got a call from him, and he said, um, I was in L.A., and he said, can you fly to San Francisco and take a meeting with Europe? And I went, huh, yeah, okay. And um, and so I, I got off the plane, went to rehearsal. They played me their new album, and it, it blew me away. I just... I thought they were just fantastic. And Joey Tempest, the lead singer, he was very polite. And he, he came over after they finished their set, and he said, listen, I want to thank you very much for taking your time out to come and, and, uh, and, and hear us play. But it, it, because he's Swedish, you know, he, he said it kind of awkwardly. He said, you're never going to do this record. <laughs> And and it, he didn't say it mean spirited or anything. That's just how it came out. And I, you know, and I was kind of taken aback a bit. And I said, "Well, you know, um, okay." And he said, "Yeah, we're waiting for Bob Rock so that he can do this record." And I said, "Listen, Bob's a friend of mine, and um, and he's very very good at what he does. And so I I think you guys will be really happy." And shook his hand again. I said, "Hey, all the best. I, I'm I'm really a big fan." And then about a month later, uh, I got I got the call from Herbie, and Herbie said, "Europe has changed their mind. They want you to do the album." And I and that was and that was one of the, the, a, a, just a weird uh, turn of events, I guess I'd have to say it like that. Yeah, that I really wasn't expecting. And then Joey and I went on to become absolute best friends. Which record did you do the final countdown? No, I did uh, Prisoners in Paradise. Okay, that was their that was the last record that they did for Sony before everybody got fired after Nirvana. And then uh, any other moments stand out? Yeah, I think starting Interscope was. Uh, That's right. Was you did uh, with Jimmy Iovine, right? Wow. That was interesting. And, uh, oh gosh, I'm, it, it's, it's, it all kind of blurs together as one just impossibility after the next, you know, because being a kid from Texas with no uh, insiders, if you will, in the, uh, in the record business, to have been uh, exposed to all the things that I was exposed to is. Pretty remarkable. Two 